on this episode, we are in danger. We are going into very dangerous territory. Christian's ambitions may be exceeding his grasp. So I want to create like a baseline editor with some basic functionality. Basic indeed. Let's run this. Nil. Ah, hi everybody, this is Christian. Welcome again, once more, to the advanced shmap tutorial. And today is gonna to be a very special episode. A lot of people have been looking forward to this episode because today we are going to be talking about external editors, about creating our own editor within Pico 8, using Pico 8 to make Pico 8. Crazy. Um, so when I first posted some of the footage from you know the preparation, prep work I was doing from the tutorial, People were especially, especially interested in the screenshots of all the internal tools that I've developed to, um, to make that shmup, to make that uh, first attempt at the shmup. And they were very curious about how these things are made. So this episode is where we're going to start working on those, explaining, you know, breaking down the process of creating the tools. Um, the, this episode and the next couple of episodes probably will going to be a bit more, I'm going to try to make them more standalone. Um, so, um, you know, people who are not into the Schmuck tutorial, who haven't followed the Schmuck tutorial until now, will still understand, you know, generally how to make an external editor. Okay? Oh, and by the way, uh, if you are watching this later on when all the episodes are already released, and if you want to skip this part, then the next episode where we're going to be back with the Schmuck is going to be episode 35. And you can just, if you want to, you can just skip straight to episode 35, download the editor that we came up with and just use it without knowing how to necessarily program it. I'm gonna, uh, at the beginning of the episode 35, I'm gonna do a small introduction on how to use that editor. So yeah, you don't have to watch the next eight episodes. Right, so let us first talk. There's just two things I wanted to like kind of get out of my system, uh, kind of like general theory. Why are we even having external editors, right? Um, so external editors usually, uh, in our case, um, are gonna be uh, about editing the data of a card. So for example, if you have a, a, a card or like a general, like a program, right? Um, it usually will have some code, but it will also have some data, right? There's gonna be also some kind of like, static information that is not uh, not so much about you know in instructions for the uh, for the computer to execute but just like you know the raw information the content of your game basically and each uh, uh pico 8 card already comes with a bunch of data and you know very very well that there is you know there's sprite data for example and uh, you have map data and you have sound effect data and all of this is data that is also part of a pico 8 program and Pico 8 conveniently already has built-in editors to edit and modify this data and create the data. So uh, there is already some editors built into Pico 8 that allow you to edit these things. That's great. But nonetheless, throughout the development, you also quite often get some additional data in your program. That says these games are not just graphics and, and levels. There is some sometimes some more stuff happening. And depending on the game, that more can be a lot more actually. So you might be in a position where you want to edit this data. There's two major reasons, there's two major um, um, motivations of why you want to create an editor. One is that sometimes, you know, the data is something that constantly needs to be managed and updated and, and appended and modified throughout the development. And quite often there is kind of like um, a bit of a um, time sync. There's a, some kind of like a procedure that always goes uh, hand in hand with this. You have to update something, you have to do some, some menial task that takes away time. And this time adds up over the development of the game, right? Every time you have to do some little thing to, to modify the data, to get it in the right format. Uh, every time you do that, you lose some time. And then it might be at some point, you might reach a point where you think about, wait, I sh maybe should do an editor to simplify, to automate some of that stuff to save some time. But of course, you have to think about, you know, whether it's actually worth it, you know, whether it's worth it to invest the time to create this editor, because that's gonna be just like, you know, also wasting time. And if uh, creating an editor will actually save you enough time over the course of the development of the game to justify the existence of the editor. So that's something to keep in mind. And the second reason why you want to create an editor, or you might want to create an editor, and you know, there's a bit of an overlap here. And the second reason might be that an editor quite often can be designed to allow you to make better creative decisions. 
so the data quite often has kind of like, um, I would call it maybe like a creative payload that it has to deliver, you know, <laughs> quite often the fun stuff is in the data, right? And the content of the game is in the data that's in supposed to be creative and fun. And you want to create maybe an environment that allows you to kind of like design this stuff. You can make really cool creative decisions designing this data. Editing numbers quite often is a bit dry and it's a bit tedious and it kind of like doesn't really allow you to do, do those, you know, fun experiments and so forth. And especially, and this is important, quite often you want to create an environment where there is like a very little delay between you making a decision and you seeing the results. You want to maybe instantly see like the, the results of your decisions. And again, editing like numbers and then running the program quite often, just like maybe even a couple of seconds, just like a bit of a resistance in that process and that kind of core loop, creative loop that can really bog down the process and, and kind of like force you into uh, more conservative decisions. You know, when it's tedious to do the changes, you are less likely to do the changes and you are more likely to hone in on something that just works. You're gonna be less likely to experiment and try out wild things if it's really tedious to change things. And that is where an editor can come in and make it less tedious to edit the data, more fun, more immediate, allows you to make better creative decisions. And I'm saying these things because there is also a huge danger here. We are going into very dangerous territory. A lot of developers, me included in the past, have set out to make an editor for the game. And throughout the process of creating the editor of the game, they abandoned the game. They just like changed their whole project into, well, I'm just making an editor for other people now. <laughs> this is a common issue. And I think the, um, the reason for that is that you know, working on an editor can be fun because you are creating possibilities. You know, you are making like big pie in the sky ideas. Oh, I'm going to make this feature that allows you to do this kind of stuff. And make, like, it's all, it's all open, you know, the, the, the world is your oyster when you're making an editor. When you're making a game, you are forced into making scary decisions. Where it's like, oh, I need to decide now what the health value of this enemy is. Uh, I don't know if a 10 is good. I'm going to go with 10. Ooh, maybe it should be 20. Uh, you know, you don't know. And uh, yeah, and quite often I think as developers, we are, we are scared of those decisions. We want to avoid them. And working on an editor feels just so much more relaxing because it's like, ah, I'm just going to make it so that you can edit the health value of the of the enemy. And I'm gonna figure it out later. And then later never comes. So yeah, long introduction, but we need to be really careful that we don't spend too much time on the editor, that we don't overproduce the editor, that it's not gonna be like this polished product for everybody. It's just gonna be something for us to fill a specific need that we need to be aware of going into it. Uh, in uh, my specific case, um, the this, this spot that we are in the Schwab tutorial is, we have like the system of creating sprites, that's how we can bring in sprites into our game. And it has a whole bunch of values and editing those values was very tedious and we're gonna edit a lot more values into the system. And it even has like this problem that we have this in this form, but that's cost a lot of tokens. We wanna bring it into this form where it's just like a huge long string. Uh, but this is even less conducive to doing edits. It's just a whole bunch of problems dealing with this data. So we want to maybe create an editor that takes care of all that stuff. So from the two reasons I was talking about, it's reason number one. It takes a lot of time to, to work with this um, data in this form. Uh, we want to make it easier, not necessarily doing any creative decisions here. We just want to save some time. But we are going to be working on editors later on that will be more about creative decision making. Okay, so this already gives us an idea of, um, because we have to also, and, and that's something I want to talk about today mostly, or work on today mostly is the, I'm gonna create an interface on, I wanna create a system of how the data gets into our game from our editor, because we're gonna have two different Pico 8 programs and they kind of have to add access the same data, right? Uh, in our case, the data that we are talking about, and this is gonna be the data for every editor that we're gonna work on, it's just gonna be a huge array. This huge array here. This array of arrays that we have. Sometimes maybe it's going to be just a one-dimensional array, but I think most of the time it's going to be a two-dimensional array, or an array of arrays. And we want the editor to create that array of arrays. And we want that array of arrays that the creator creates get into our main game. Uh, and how are we going to do that? Initially, I was thinking about things like, you know, maybe you can export it, put it in a clipboard and paste it. But that, again, that introduces this friction, this kind of like extra delay um, that builds up over time. We want to make it as seamless as possible. As seamless as possible. 
and a tool to make it as seamless as possible is the humble include. So we're gonna do something like include, hashtag include, um, my file dot txt. And it, you can see it turns orange. Include is a feature that a lot of languages have and I was really relieved and, and happy about when it was included in Pico 8. Uh, you can do a lot of stuff with include. Uh, what it basically does is uh, whenever there is this include statement here, before the program gets executed and everything, even before it gets um, like packed into a file, um, the Pico 8, what Pico 8 does is it opens up this text file and it takes the contents and just pastes it in, into, into this, just replaces the include statement with the contents of the file. So we can like outsource parts of your uh, code into an external text file. That's cool. And it feels like, okay, sure, now I don't have just one file, I have multiple files. That doesn't seem like such a world-changing thing, but it is a big deal. It allows you to do a lot of weird things and fun things. For example, it's one of the major uh, pieces that makes external editors so much more fun to work with with Pico 8 because you can open up multiple tabs and you can organize your code better by splitting it into individual files. In our case, we are going to use this external text file. We're gonna use that to um, host our data. Our, all our data is gonna be an external text file and both our um, external editor and our game will just access the same file. They will all share the same data file and grab the, the, the huge array from that data file. Okay, enough talk, let's see some action. So I'm gonna open up the folder and the folder is, I don't know why I have untitled P8 here. I don't know, let's delete this. Uh, I'm gonna create a little test file just to, to show off how include works. Test.txt. And then I'm, not, I'm gonna open this with a text editor. And I'm just gonna uh, type in something like uh, test equals uh, never gonna give you up. We don't do hello world here. <laughs> just gonna put never gonna give you up in this text file. Right, and then I'm gonna open in, uh, in Pico 8. I'm gonna save this as editor. Uh, I'm gonna save an, as an empty Pico 8 file as editor P8. And then I'm gonna go include uh, test.txt. And then I'm gonna go function. Okay, so now we're gonna just gonna draw a function. We're gonna just clear the screen and I'm gonna just print test to to the screen, right? We're gonna do something like this. Let's run this, nil. Oh, not text, test. <laughs> oh my gosh, there we go. So now you can see this external file with this, this information, this code here, was in included at this point here. And then um, we just have this test variable uh, defined inside this external file. And we can access this uh, in the code, even though the actual code that we have here never, never defines any test. And I call this test and the variable is called test, but it doesn't have to be test. It can be also something like JSON. And I'm gonna print JSON. And it, I have to save the external file. I didn't save the external file. <laughs> there we go, oh my gosh, I just, I'm so stressed out. All right, so these are the fundamentals of how the data will eventually get in here. Instead of just like the never gonna give you up, we're gonna have like just the, um, the big array in here, right? But now the question is, how are we going to get stuff out of the editor into the text file? And the way we do this is we're gonna use um, so-called um, printh. There is a fun function called printh, and that can put strings of text into all sorts of places. One of them being the clipboard and the other one being a text file. Um, now this only works for Pico 8 if Pico 8 is run locally as a, a, you know, as a program on your PC. It doesn't work on the web. There's certain limitations to this. You cannot just edit any file, write stuff into any file on your system. And there are some limitations to make sure that you cannot make malware with Pico 8. But yeah. Um, I never go, uh, let us put something else in here. Um, somebody once told me. Um, we're gonna put this into, this text into um, test.txt. 
Um, and then we're gonna, oh, wait, 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 it has to be like this. And then the last one we're gonna set to true. Um, I'm gonna explain these things in a second, but first let's just run this. Okay, it seems like nothing changed, but now let's open up this text file. Uh, I'm gonna actually use a different program. Right, I used um, Notepad Plus in here because Notepad Plus detects if there has been any changes to a file and then um, and then loads a new version of that file. So now uh, we wrote the text somebody once told me into our test.txt. That's how we can get text, you know, import text from a text file into our program and then we can make some changes and we can write it back into that text file. Now there's a problem here because now we wrote just some gibberish, like some just like human text into the text file and now it's no longer really Pico8 code. So now if you run this, you're gonna get an error because somebody once told me that's not Pico8 code, sadly. Uh, so we're gonna to wanna to make sure that if we change the text file, um, that we, you know, it's actual Pico8 code. We have to generate Pico8 code uh, using our export function. But yeah, I just wanted to give you like an overview of general process. Now let us step back now and let us um, actually set up the actual editor. Okay, let's delete this. Let us uh, remove the include for now because it's gibberish for now. Um, I'm gonna set up a state machine as we had before with an UPD and draw function. So we're gonna have um, UPD and, uh, oh no, that's gonna be D, DRW and update 60. That's important. Uh, yeah, UPD. Uh, we're gonna have uh, draw. We're gonna have update. The same thing as we had previously. I just like those state machines and especially with editors. Uh, a lot of the stuff about editor is gonna be UI development and state machines are very important for UI development. It's a bit tedious, but if you do some good setup early on, then you can avoid the horrible, horrible spaghetti code that usually UI eventually turns into at some point. You can delay it a little bit. You cannot avoid it, but you can delay it. Okay, so I'm gonna create a function. Uh, so the first state um, is gonna be, I'm gonna call this uh, draw table. Um, I'm just gonna, I want to, because you know, we're gonna import a huge array of arrays, so basically a two-dimensional array, and just gonna want to, like in our no, first mode that we're gonna create, is I'm gonna do, I want to just draw it on the screen. I'm gonna just I want to see it and then we're gonna think about how we can edit the data. And then an update function we're gonna call this update table. Just setting just setting stuff up. Uh, and then we're gonna go drw equals um, and upd equals update table. Okay, so let us now do like a CLS2, I don't know, just so we can see something, we can see something. Okay, something is happening. Uh, let's now print something to the screen. Just so we can see something. Okay, this is good. Now I want to introduce to you something that is really fun and I, I that's kind of like a aesthetic choice for my editors that I think works really well. Uh, something that was uh, included um, in one of the recent Pico 8 versions is that um, we can format the text. When you print text on the screen, you can do some formatting using kind of like special characters. Uh, and I actually want to create a thing where, um, let me see, uh, when you put a backslash and then hashtag and then a number, it will draw a background. Uh, like uh, there's going to be a box behind the text. So now you can see there's a black box behind the text. And we're gonna use this kind of like a, as an element to kind of like make the text pop against the background because it's very likely that our editors will just draw stuff on the background and then draw the text as UI on top. And something that can very easily happen is that, you know, the background's gonna have lots of like different colors and the text might become not readable. Um, so as like a common UI element for everything in our editors, we're gonna have like this black, background on, on, on the, all the text that we're gonna to draw to the screen that is part of the UI. And in fact, it's gonna be so fundamental. I'm gonna create a function for this. We're gonna call this BG print. So BG print uh, text X, Y color. I'm just gonna be a little wrapper. Uh, and then we're gonna call BG print instead of the print. And it's gonna be something like 
is we'll just add this character, this background character at the beginning of the print. It will just like print, but it will print with the with the backslash hashtag zero in front of it. So this dot dot to combine two uh, two strings. I'm gonna add the string that we actually want to print x y c like this. So now when we're printing real test to the screen, uh, we didn't specify the color. There we go. <laughs> I was getting nervous there. Okay, so now we're printing stuff to the screen with this special cool background uh, color. Okay, so let us now add, uh, let's make some useful, useful data in our text file. So we're gonna go do something like, I'm gonna call it test for now, but you know. Uh, useful data. <laughs> uh, then we're gonna include it at the beginning. Now, uh, an important thing to note is that you can, you don't have, like, because we put it on top always, the include. All right, here's where we put the, the include. I'm gonna save this here. Um, we put it on the very top, but you can put it somewhere else. We can also put it in the init function. There is no reason why we cannot put it in here. And if you do that, then that code gets pasted in here. Copy paste it in here. Um, so I want to maybe do that um, for reasons that we we will understand in a second here. Um, so now I want to actually print this data on the screen real quick. We already did that, but you know, just want to make sure. Okay, useful data. Good. Uh, now I want to work on the export function, like to set up the scaffolding for the export function. We're gonna have to think about you know when does the uh, code export things, and I think a good choice for this is to create. Uh, a menu item. So the menu item is this thing like when you press enter uh, you get like this pq8 menu and with some options here we can reset the card and so forth and you actually have abilities to put additional menu items in here. I talked about some about this on an earlier episode but now we're actually doing it. And the function to do that is um, I'm gonna do it right away here. I'm gonna call it menu item. Uh, now uh, we have to type in like the number of the menu item. Each menu item that you add additionally will have a number. We're just gonna call it one. Uh, it orders the menu items, but also the number, uh, you can use that as a reference to maybe they later delete them. So it's, it's kind of important to remember which menu item is what number. Uh, then the next thing is gonna be the name of the menu, that actual text that actually appears in the menu, export. And then you type in the name of a function that uh, that gets called when the user, selects, user selects that menu item. We're gonna call this export. We're gonna create a function called export. And we're gonna create a new tab for this. We're gonna call this IO. And we're gonna create this function. Like this. For now, I don't want to do anything with that except for maybe uh, setting the export to export it like I'm gonna set this test variable to export it when this function gets called just to see that something actually does something I'm not we're not writing anything into into anything yet just yet okay let's try this I'm gonna say this run um, and now we have our export function here right and then we can if you press X you can see that the variable has changed this code this export function has been called cool. So now we're gonna have to go about um, generating something, writing something in the file, as we as I already talked about before. Um, let us let us let us write something that is actually PQ8 code in the file, just to see, you know, just like one step after another, right? So we're gonna go something like local s equals. We're gonna have some kind some kind of string, and we're gonna yeah, we're gonna print h this that's text into test.txt, comma true um i oh i forgot to talk about what the true means so you know s is the text that you're putting into the, in the file uh, text txt is the file that you're putting the text into uh true means if this is set to true that the third um, argument is set to true it just replaces all of the text that was in the file previously uh, if it's set to false it doesn't replace the text that was already in the file it just takes the text that you want to write and adds it at the end so you can do like something like a log file where you can just you know print new events and add them to the list of already existing events to a file. In our case, we just want to always write the entire data completely into our into our file. So that's why we're setting this to true. Replace everything that was there before with our stuff. 
Uh, okay, so now we just, what if you wanted to just write something like this, right? Like test equals quotation marks um, yeah, yeah. and then something, right? So we would write something like test equals. And now we're getting a problem. Now we have to want to write quotation marks in a string. But if you do that, then the string is over, right? It's just like, it's it's over now. So how do we do this? How do, how do we put a quotation mark in a string that is enclosed in quotation marks? <laughs> it seems like that's that's not really possible. There is a trick there. You can do a so-called so escape. So whenever you want to put a quotation mark symbol inside a string, uh, you have to encode it. So PQA doesn't recognize it as the end of the string, but just like as the actual character quotation marks. Um, and that is going to be backslash and quotation marks. And that escapes, we, we call it, it escapes the quotation marks. So now the next character is no longer interpreted as the end of the string, but now as the actual character quotation marks. Uh, and then we call this exported data. And then again, backslash quotation marks, because we actually want to export a quotation string. And now again, quotation marks, now we're actually ending the string. <laughs> it's a bit complicated. Okay, so now we encoded this data and we're writing this data into our file. Let's see if this works. So we have useful data in our text file. Now we're gonna go export. Something maybe happened, we don't quite know. And you can already see this is a bit of a problem. We're modifying data and we don't really have get a good, good feedback of whether this worked or not. It would be good to have some kind of system that tells us, yes, the export worked. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you now go into the into our text file here, you can see, ah, something has been changed. We need to reload this. And now our exported data is actually in, in the text file. So now if you reload our, our program, the exported data is gonna be here. Ta-da! Okay, so this sets up a lot of the basics here. I just wanted to add one more thing. I just want to show you a completely new new thing that I think is also very useful. And that is uh, a lot of our editors will need the sprite sheet from our main program. But again, we have that problem where the sprite sheet in our main program is like, we have to always export that sprite sheet and get it into an editor whenever we make small changes. And it would be nice if this was something that worked automatically. Right now, the sprite sheet in our editor is empty. It would be nice to get the sprite sheet from our main program in here without us having to do it manually every time we make a small change. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. Well, there is a function called uh, reload. Uh, reload gets um, some information from this card or some other card on your hard drive and puts it into your memory somewhere. Um, it is. It can be used for something like you know multi-carting. There's this idea that you know to get around of the um, around the limitations of uh, you know a single PQ8 card, you can split your game into multiple cards, and then reload parts of the different cards. Like you know put the data, different sprite sheets, and different maps into different cards, and then load those things in as they are needed. Um, that's good. There's pros and cons against that. But for now, we're not gonna use this for this kind of stuff. We're just you're gonna use this to exchange sprite data between our main program and our editor. So reload function takes a bunch of parameters. First parameter is the destination, the, the memory address of where you want to write this new information. It just so happens to be that the sprite data is at address zero. So zero x zero, or you can also write zero probably, but zero x zero because it's, um, uh, because it's hexadecimal. Uh, then the source from where we're getting stuff, again, we're just copying the sprite sheet over, so source and destination should be the same. Now comes the length. How long is the sprite data? It's um, 2000 in hexadecimal. <laughs> I'm, for, I don't, I'm not gonna do the conversion. I just looked it up, it's 2000. The sprite, the entire sprite sheet is 2000 hexadecimal units big. And finally, we have to specify from where we're loading the data. And that's gonna be cow shmup dot uh, p8. We have to be careful that when we rename our main program, our, our editor will no longer work. So we have to be cognizant about renaming our main program. But yeah, let's run this. Now as you can see, there was a little, little animation in the top right corner, right? 
what's that about? Well, that is kind of like, a, there's a bit of a delay of the reloading thing, so you don't can't do it constantly, I think. And yes, that's, so that's what happened here. Uh, I just want to um, just see the difference. I just want to see, I'm going to do like a SPR uh, 0, um, 0, 0, 120. Uh, no, wait, uh, it's 16 times 16, I think. I just want to draw the sprite sheet on the screen. And there is our sprite sheet. Ta-da! And generally, this is where we're going to continue on in the next episode. I want to create like a template. That's why I called this program, this card, Editor P8. I want to create like a template, a, a default editor that kind of like has all the functionality that every editor in our in our tool set will need. And we're going to create all those editors that we, are, that we have planned. I'm going to develop them from this starting point. So I want to create like a baseline editor with some basic functionality. But of course, we're not there yet. But for now, let's go to the doggy zone. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So you see where this is going. Uh, we're not there yet, but we're going there. Um, so there's going to be two challenges I have for you for the, for the dog zone, for the two next steps we're going to work with. Uh, for now, we are working with a single variable. We're writing this variable, exported data test variable. We're writing this into the text file and we're getting it from the text file. But now, I, um, that's obviously not that great. We want it not just to be a single variable. We want it to be an array. It's, we specifically want it to be an array of arrays. So uh, the first challenge for the doggy zone is going to be put an array in text.txt, put just an array in there, and then I want you to draw it on the screen. Just a simple warm-up. You just put an array there and draw it on the screen. If you're really feeling feeling it, then put a two-dimensional array in there, even maybe like even our sprite sheet, uh, my sprite data. Put it that into the text file, uh, the test file, and then print all the numbers on the screen. Second challenge is going to be, and that's going to be tr more tricky. Rewrite the export function so it exports that same array back into <laughs> into the text file, into the test.txt file. Uh, write an export function for an array or even a two-dimensional array. These are the challenges for the doggy zone. Right, right, right. So now we will go to the end of the episode where, as always, I will say a big, big thank you, a huge shout out to everybody who is supporting this show on coffee.com. Thank you so much for your support, guys. Thank you for making this show possible. And also I want to give a big uh, welcome and hello to all the people who joined in the meantime. That's going to be Jeremy, Windigo, Alex Wolf, and Jason Abel. Thank you for your support and welcome to the crew. All right. And also I wanted to talk about something to feature something this time around. I want to feature something that I think is very cool. And I think that a lot of people missed. And that is going to be uh, a friend of the show, Ectane, which I already talked about so many times in, on the show. But Ectane has some really cool videos on his channel. And the video I want to give a huge shout out to this time around is going to be um, Cross Gunner DX and Infinite Death Diary and Replay Showcase. It's a very long video where Actane basically walks you through the process of how he uh, took his cross gunner from the basic shmup showcase and upgraded it and developed it further. I love this video because Actane is um, somebody who is not really like a computer science person, not necessarily somebody who has like a formalized, you know, computer developer um, education. He does it very, like, things very instinctively from the guts, but he gets a lot of things right. And I love how in this specific video he walks you step by step, day by day, individual decision, design decisions that he went through and tested out. He walks you through, you know, very slow steps through this entire process. And I think it's an incredible insight into the development process of a developer. And a lot of the things that Actane does, which is, you know, like just trying wild things, doing all this experimentation and just seeing how things look and deciding afterwards. A lot of these things are right. He's doing a lot of good things there. So I want you to check out this video, Cross Gunner DX and Infinite Dev Diary and Replay Showcase. Yes, yes, yes. So we are now in the editor. We are, have set up some basic structure here, but now we're gonna move on next time around to make it work with arrays so we can actually show our data from the game. See you next time around, guys. Bye-bye.